I'm Sholene Espinoza. I'm a third year medical student at St. George's University. And the second part of our discussions are going to be based off of the first part where we essentially learned the mechanics of the immune system and now we're going to apply it in a clinical uh, vignette. And so what I'd like to do is kind of talk about overall a strategy, if you will, to applying immuno, what we've learned so far, especially those cytokines, to, uh, to the clinical vignettes. So the first thing that I always do is I ask myself is the question that they're asking me, is it a function of too much of your immune system? Okay, so you've got too much or not enough of the immune system in terms of uh, your cells. So immunopathology, in other words, your immune system is tack attacking its own, or immunodeficiency where you don't have enough of an immune system to, to be able to mount a response to whatever pathogen is trying to enter your body. Then the next thing that I look at is essentially are we talking about the innate system, which we talked about with regard to your macrophages, your neutrophils, and uh, NADPH oxidase, and the armamentarium, the innate that's always there, that's present, that has no memory, and that is essentially immediate. So is it an innate? Uh, is it an innate immune response, or are we talking about, I think I misspelled that, uh, or are we talking about a adaptive response, okay? So if we're talking about innate, like I mentioned, a lot of the immunopathologies associated with an innate would be a deficiency. So one of the things that we talked about is NADPH oxidase uh, deficiency. Another one would be a myeloperoxidase deficiency. Okay, so that would be part, you know, just an example. We'll talk a lot more about that in, as we go on. In terms of the adaptive immunity, now we're talking about the smart cells, okay? So the B cells uh, and the T cells. And as you recall, there were a couple of diseases that we talked about with regard to the B cells. One was Bruton's A gamma globinemia, which is essentially you stop at the pre-B cell. You don't get beyond that. And so you're not able to produce those immunoglobulins that are so critical for fighting bacterial infections. And the T cell, you probably already know this, but for example, if you don't have a thymus, you're not going to have T cells. One example of that would be the DeGeorge uh, uh, defect in chromosome chromosome 22, so-called catch-22, which we'll get into. So that's a couple of big picture in terms of B cell and T cell. And when I look at the clinical symptoms of a patient who has a B cell deficiency, it tends to be, I think, this is a generalization, but I tend to think B for bacteria. Yes, you definitely have uh, antibodies that are going to help you with viruses. That's how we develop vaccines and fungi to a certain degree. But usually you'll see straight away a defect in bacterial uh, bacterial immune response when you have a deficiency in B cells. With regard to T cell deficiency, you're going to see a problem with fighting intracellular uh, pathogens such as mycobacterium and those types, which you'll learn a lot more about as you get into microbiology. But just think of it in terms of T cell is cell mediated, particularly against intracellular pathogens, whereas B cells are out there, antigens, uh, antibodies rather, against those bacteria. So that's where sort of the big picture is how I think of, of those two uh, components, innate and adaptive. And just circling back for a second, if you look at the innate system, uh, for example, if you have an NADPH oxidase deficiency, the clinical vignette there is going to be someone who has probably a lot of Staph aureus type of an infection. We'll go through these questions that will make a lot more sense. So is it too much immunity? or not enough. So I've just outlined the cases of not enough immunity. So what about too much immunity? So too much immunity, first question that you could ask yourself, what would be a sort of a low-hanging fruit question on that would be, well, you have regulatory cells of the immune system. And we've talked about the uh, Tregs that come straight out of the thymus. Okay, we've talked about the AI regs that are that are proliferated from T sub not type cytokines, and those are proliferated based on cytokine milieu as we've studied with this TGF beta, okay? And the Tregs here, those come out of, like I said, the thymus, but what's common to these guys is this FOXP3, which is a transcription factor that essentially turns off this 
massive immune response that we have. So if you start seeing uh, anything in the chain here that is missing, then you can expect that your patient is going to start to attack his own or he's not going to be able to turn down that response. And another aspect of regulation, if you remember on more of a cellular level, is that we had this whole response between CD200, okay, which is going to be on your smart cells, like say a T cell, for example. And then that's going to connect into your, let's say, your more dumb cells. Um, I hate to say that about a macrophage, but, uh, and he has the CD200R. Remember that R for retard, which means that essentially that uh, that essentially um, stops that particular activity of that cell. So let's say, as we discussed before, that you had a very smart tumor that could downregulate CD200, so which or or upregulate CD200. So either way, it, it would just depend on what the pathogen or what the tumor was. So let's just sort of unpack this. If you had an increase in CD200. Then, then in that case, that would block, lock into the macrophage and stop the macrophage from killing. So a lot of, you know, pathogens out there, uh, let's say, for example, bacteria could use this as a defense strategy. And similarly, a tumor cell could also upregulate CD200, which would turn off your own immune system to be able to fight tumors. So there would be an example of an immunodeficiency which would result in immunopathology. And we'll get much more into, uh, much more into the deficiencies as we come along. So let's go into a couple of questions. Uh, and again, this is really, you know, a, 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 an incredibly exciting portion of the class because here we've spent all this time learning essentially the alphabet or our multiplication tables, and now we actually get to do the algebra or do the, you know, write the uh, War and Peace novel here with regard to Im immunology. And I always think in my mind, uh, why is this so so-called high yield? You know, I took the USMLE recently, and I would say of any uh, course subjects that were tested uh, more than another, it would be immunology because essentially if you think about it, the human immune system is the most powerful agent we have to fight disease and it can also kill us if it's misdirected. And you know, I like to think that hopefully one day we'll look at chemotherapy like we do the lobotomy where we're not going to be toxifying patients and instead we're going to be clearly targeting uh, these tumors with uh, with the assistance from the immune system. So that's why I think there's so much emphasis on it. Anyway, enough about that. Let's go into the first question. The, you have a patient, they're 18 month old, okay, who has suffered from chronic bacterial infections, bacterial infections, and he's not had any viral or fungal infections beyond what would normally be for his age category. So you might consider that he has one of the following, okay? so. First of all, let's step back from the question. What are we saying? He's 18 months old. So that means that he definitely should be able to have his own immune response in terms of producing IgG, right? So up until about the six month point, the child is getting the immunoglobulins from his mother. So beyond six months is when you start to see immunopathology, immunodeficiency with regard to, to uh, the little guys. Then the second thing about this question is it says chronic bacterial infections. So that tells you maybe something's going on with the B cells, but yet his viral and his fungal infections seem to be, you know, seem to be able to clear those. So let's look at the uh, answer choices. So A is the patient has a deficiency in CD40L, all right? So first of all, you got to remember what that does. So if you remember that you have your macrophage and he has his MHC class 2 molecule and the T cell, she has her T cell receptor, all right? Uh, CD4 positive cell. And then you also have, this guy has a B7-1, the co-stimulatory CD28, all right? These, these molecules are still very critical because again, they're targets for drugs and whatnot, all right? But then there's this other component to this reaction where this guy, the macrophage, has CD40 and the T cell has CD40L. And these two connect with each other. And what that allows is for isotype switching from an IgM situation, okay, if you were to have a, in this case, a B cell, let's say, presenting to a T cell, generically, you would have, um, 
you would have IgM. And so once you get this reaction here with these two, you can isotype switch to IgG and have a much more specific immune response. So that looks pretty good. If you don't have a CD40L, you have what you call hyper IgM uh, syndrome, and you may not be able to, uh, you know, fight the bacterial infections as well as you would if you could isotype switch. So choice B is an overexpression of IgG. That doesn't make any sense because we've already talked about how IgG can, uh, can fight bacterial infections uh, or help you do that. A deficiency in DAF, if you remember what DAF does, is that prevents your little friends uh, in terms of your membrane attack complex. The DAF is what prevents you from making essentially the membrane attack complex act on your own cells, okay? So a deficiency in that would cause your cells to lice, so that's definitely not the case. And then D is an overexpression of IL-10. Now IL-10 is going to essentially suppress your immune system and shove it from going to a Th1 response to a Th2 response like we talked about, but again that's not necessarily going to um, be specific to bacterial. You'd probably see viral and fungal infections as well. So the answer is a deficiency in CD40L. Question number two, your patient's tumor is utilizing the same mechanism that your immune system uses to downregulate the activity of macrophages. Which of the following would be the most likely cluster designation that the tumor is expressing? Okay, and we just in fact went over this. So the answer here is going to be C. So CD200, remember that CD200 is going to be, uh, is going to lock into CD200, is going to lock into CD200R, and then that's going to retard and suppress your immune response. Question number three is, one of the main problems for patients who have ischemic events, so let's say for example you have a loss of blood flow because you have atherosclerosis or some other problem or a clot, say, are the so-called reperfusion injuries. So once your blood system or once your, uh, your, your body clears that clot or, you, or you're able to lyse that clot in some way, blood starts rushing in there and can be, bring these inflammatory mediators, reactive oxygen species that are packed along by your little friendly macrophages. So that's the background of that. Now while it's true that free radicals mediate much of this damage, the cells also largely responsible are the influx of the immune cells, like I just said, your neutrophils and your macrophages. So if you wanted to design an antibody in order to block the reentry of these cells, what would that antibody bind to? So all we're basically talking about is that whole immunology or uh, sorry, inflammatory uh, and inflammation discussion that we had. So choice A is ICAM, so intracellular adhesion molecules. Yes, absolutely, that's correct, okay? Because if, remember that the first thing that happens in, the first thing that happens when you've got a, uh, a reaction uh, and you have an injury, right? You have Hagerman factor and you start the intrinsic coagulation pathway and you get, uh, get calicrine which splits C5 into C5A and then that basically C5A increases histamine and you get P-selectin, okay? So P-selectin, so you, you're sitting here and this is the endothelium and it's got P-selectin so that starts a, kind of an initial stick for these cells that are rolling through here, so they stick. But then as you continue on, you're gonna get a C-reactive protein with IL-6 secreted by macrophages. You're gonna get TNF and IL-1 is also gonna increase your ICAMs and VCAMs, and that's firm adhesion. So once you firmly adhese, now you can, uh, the next step is to diapodese and come into uh, to be able for these cells to come in to the tissue and meanwhile they bring with them these reactive oxygen species. Now again, you know, this is a normal process but too much of a good thing is a bad thing and so what they do is you can target a drug that will target ICAM so it will reduce the number of these macrophages coming in packing their little bombs uh, in their backpacks that are going to blow up your tissue in a reperfusion injury. Now choice B is an IL-2 receptor. Okay, again, that's a T-cell mediated issue. We're talking about macrophages and reperfusion, so that doesn't apply. 
And while I'm on it, sometimes if you're totally lost in immunology, just write down, you know, innate or adaptive and what type of cell it is. So ICAMS, you know that's inflammation, right? IL-2R is a T-cell mediated. BCR is B-cell receptor. That's a B-cells. We're not talking about that. TCR is T-cell receptor. And CD200R, that's a immunosuppression. So you can also sort of back into the question. And then the other thing that you might do is which one of these is not like the other, okay? Really, the only one that's dealing, well, I guess you could argue CD200R is part of the innate system because it's turning off macrophages, but certainly ICAM is part of inflammation. We're talking about inflammation in the stem of the question. So the answer there is A. Number four is your patient has a defect and is unable to form the MAC complex. Okay, so the membrane attack complex. This will probably be on every exam that you ever take uh, in terms of board uh, type exams. So she most likely has what? All right, so the membrane attack complex, remember, is that last part of complement where you've got your C5 convertase splits the C5 and it goes C5, 6, 7, um, 8, 9, all the way down essentially, and you start drilling holes in the cell. All right, and if you can't do that, then you can't fight Neisseria uh, meningitis. So that the answer is going to be E. Okay, if you couldn't isotype switch, that's going to be a CD40, CD40L. You'd have too much IgM. That's how they would present that. In B, if inability for the macrophages to bind IgE, that's just kind of retarded. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense. Uh, C is the inability to opsonize bacteria. If you couldn't opsonize, then that would mean you had a complement deficiency. All right, so that would be, or something with C3 convertase, so you, so that would be a problem with that, or autoimmunity problems. That doesn't really make any sense either. So the answer is E. Now number five, uh, you're in South Sudan, which actually I just came back from two days ago, out in um, out in the in the bush learning medicine from uh, Dr. Luca Dang. No electricity, no running water. Um, so I'll I'll integrate some of that because it's really quite educational because South Sudan is is uh, ground zero for the human immune system, uh, as you might imagine. But anyway, you're in South Sudan and you visit a leprosy clinic, and these patients were likely to be unable to mount a Th1 immune response. So what is the most important cytokine for mounting a continued Th1 response? And we'll talk more about leprosy in a little bit, but with regard to a continued Th1 response, and again, this is just straight up what we talked about before, and the answer is C, interferon gamma. Remember, that's what feeds the fight in terms of your uh, Th1 response. Now IL-12, what does that do? Well, IL-12, remember, is secreted by the macrophages, and it tells, essentially, the NK cell, let's make this a little more clear, your NK cell, all right, has a IL-12 receptor on it, okay, and then your, your macrophage secretes it. Well, then this tells, this NK cell to secrete interferon gamma, okay? But the more direct answer, so there's some, there's, they're both kind of right, but the most correct answer, and that's what they tend to do on the USMLE, is they'll have two that are very similar, but one is the most correct. So that's why, you know, I sort of throw that in there. Interferon gamma is clearly uh, the one that you must have. Uh, TNF, again, that's secreted by the macrophage, and remember that's going to increase, um, you know, turn on like 3,000 different genes. It's one of the greatest selling drugs out there on the market is anti-TNF, and it's also going to increase the expression of your ICAMS, your BCAMS inflammation. And then IL-2, of course, is a, uh, is a growth factor for T cells, any kind of T cell, regulatory T cells, T, uh, CD4 uh, T cells, CD8 T cells, all right? So it's a growth factor for T cells, not specific to the Th1 response. So that's why that's incorrect. Number six is your patient has a virus that infects over 90% of the U.S. population. The symptoms experienced by these patients vary widely. If you were to pick one cytokine that would cause your immune system to go towards a non-cytotoxic 
T-cell root, the root that takes the fight away from the macrophages. Okay, remember, cytotoxic is going to be your Th1. Remember, we talked about sort of the George Bush cytokines. They're ready to go to. They're ready to go to war. It's like you know, whose butt do you want me to kick? Those are the. Those are the Th1 cytokines. Okay, but we're not talking about that here. We're talking about you know the the sort of uh, you know the other guys that aren't so happy to do that. So the root that takes the fight away from the macrophage. Macrophage. What would that cytokine? Uh, uh, B, and the answer there is uh, so have a look here, and um, the answer would be uh, number B, which is IL-10. Now this is an interesting, um, you know, you have to sort of know a little background because I've sort of tricked tricked you a little bit. So IL-2, all right, that's again that's a generic t, t cell growth factor. IL-10 is if you could pick one sort of party pooper cytokine, it would be IL-10. In that IL-10 is going to reduce the ability for this uh, for this reaction to to secrete the interferon gamma. Okay, now true enough, IL-4 will push a Th2 cytokine, but remember it's a balance between Th2 and Th1. So if you have a little bit of IL-4 and a little bit of interferon gamma, they're going to sort of play this tug of war. But if you throw a bunch of IL-10 on the fire, you're going to put it out straight away. So that's why that's the most uh, accurate. And we've already talked about T, uh, TNF, so the answer, the best answer, is number B, which is um, IL-10. So what are we talking about? What, this this uh, virus that infects about 90% of the population, who are we talking about? So it's a bonus question, and that would be um, our friend Epstein-Barr, okay, actually has the ability to secrete, uh, she has the ability to secrete that IL-10, that's why she uh, is quite effective, and then it does hook into the B-cell CR2 receptor, so that's where she, that's where she acts. Now, interestingly enough, a uh, trick question they love to ask you is if they show you a blood smear and they see, and you look at a bunch of goofy, uh, a bunch of goofy lymphocytes, and you know it's EBV, they give that to you in the stem of the question that you sort that out. Then they say, what kind of cells are those lymphocytes? The weird ones that are in a blood smear are actually the T cells trying to clear that Epstein-Barr infection. So I don't have a picture of it, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Clearly, Epstein-Barr infects B cells, but the goofy looking cells that you see on a, on a blood smear are those uh, brave T cells that are trying to clear that infection. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, which is not for an immunoclast, but more for pathoclass or pathophys. Okay, so number eight. You have a 10-year-old patient who is prone to gastrointestinal infections as well as sinopulmonary infections. So what, what are we thinking here? Mm, these, kind, these two go together, GI and sinopulmonary. I'm thinking mucus. Who paints the mucus, uh, the mucosa of the human immune system, the immunopaint, which is IgA. So that's what I'm thinking of. Just just from the very first sentence. Now she's able to mount a defense against skin pathogens and seems to be doing well otherwise. If you were to guess which immunoglobulin she lacked, which one would it be? Okay, so I already gave away uh, stupidly the answer, which is IgA, the immunopaint. This is pathognomonic where you have these two types of infections that affect mucosal surfaced uh, organs and that's going to be IgA. Now if she had an Ig uh, e deficiency, then okay, what would she have be susceptible to? Parasites, right? Because IgE is instrumental with parasites. Um, IgG, she would have problems with uh, numerous bacterial infections. And if she didn't have IgM, she wouldn't be able to even start the immune response. So she'd probably have some kind of B cell problem that where she couldn't um, where she couldn't mount IgM. Or maybe she's got some kind of cancer. And so yeah, she's got you know she's got uh, immunoglobulins. Uh, up the yin yang, but they're all of one type of the cancer type, so all the other ones are taking it, you know, sort of in the shorts and they're not able to mount an immune system. Now, immune tech. So let's step back. One of the couple of other points about IgA deficiencies that, that, that are kind of odd. Number one is that even though parasites, you know, we think of IgE and eosinophils, right? They're, they're first on the fight and all that. Um, but in terms of parasites, except for one, Giardia. 
Giardia, you need an IgA uh, response to be able to fight Giardia. And remember, Giardia likes to attack small intestines, so that kind of makes sense. The other thing is it's the most common immunodeficiency uh, that we know of. About like 1 in 300 of us are immunodeficient. Number two, uh, 3 on this oddball is that you're never going to give IgA to a patient because they will have a potentially an anaphylactic uh, reaction. In fact, you're very hesitant to transfuse these patients because of the same reason. IgG, you know, when I was in the military, we used to get a shot of immunoglobulin if we'd go off to some weird place, um, you know, definitely, but you don't do that with IgA, okay? And certainly if the patient is not uh, immunocomp, uh, is immunosuppressed with regard to IgA. And I guess the last thing would be that, you know, not everybody's created equal. You might have someone who's a little bit IgA deficient and they don't really seem to manifest all these infections or you have somebody else who gets a lot of sinopulmonary or GI infection. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's variable. So keep, keep your mind uh, open to that with these questions. Number nine is, uh, why do live mucosal vaccines provide more immunity? That's kind of a weird question, but, um, but they like this question about what's different. You know, what are the differences of a live vaccine? And the answer is A, they enable you to develop that IgA immune response. So if you take the flu vaccine, snort it up your nose, that straight away touches that mucosal surface and you get a better immune response. So what's the difference is, let's say take polio vaccine. So we have the killed vaccine, Salk, right? So the Salk vaccine is the killed polio vaccine. That is not live. That's not, that doesn't give you an IgA. So that's the way I was told to remember Salk for killed, K for killed. Um, so what does that mean? That means that you're going to get infected by polio, but oh, looky here, you've got antibodies and that's going to stop it. As opposed to the Sabin vaccine, which has IgA, which when that polio tries to cross that mucosal surface, it's going to be stopped by IgA. So, yeah, so it's actually, you know, the rest of the world in the United States, we're paranoid about everything and we take the killed vaccine, but the rest of the world does the Sabin, which is a live vaccine. Apart from uh, where I just was in South Sudan, like I mentioned, with some uh, with the polio people, and polio is live and well. I think their last case was two years ago. They're now vaccinating kids, and they're trying to do sabum, but again, a uh, cold chain can be a problem there. So that's a limiting factor for the live vaccine. So again, uh, you do get IgA with the live vaccine. That's the big thing there. So number 10, let's try to... Uh, stop rambling here on my part. Number 10, your patient has monoclonal proliferation of one type of B cell. Anytime you see that monoclonal proliferation, I'm thinking cancer, okay? And you have found a clinical trial to enroll your patient in. Which of the following would be the most likely target for a monoclonal antibody in this trial? Okay, uh, so here we just have to ask is, you know, which one of these has to do with B cells? In other words, uh, would take out all the B cells. It seems a little excessive to take out all the B cells, but again, you've got a B cell cancer, so, so you got to sort of do the, you know, do the, uh, take out all of them out at one time. So CD20 we know is the pan B cell marker. Remember that you have, you have pro B cells and then it goes to pre and then it goes to immature and then it goes to mature naive which to me is an oxymoron, but that's what they call it. Um, and so with the pro, you have CD19, and the pre, you have CD20, right? And then remember, this is where you have your BTK. So right here, I mean, essentially, you're knocking out all your B cells. Um, and in fact, there's a very popular drug, Rituxan, that does just this uh, for B cell cancers. So the answer is, uh, is A. CD11, remember that's part of the adhesion molecules. That's not going to help you with the B cell cancer. CD40, that's on the B cells, but it's for isotype switching. So that's not going to help you with the monoclonal proliferation. CD3, that's a T cell receptor. So we're talking about B cells. That doesn't apply. So the answer is A. Number 11, your patient is highly atopic. So that just means they're prone to allergies. You might expect the following when measuring their leukocytes. Leukopenia, would they have few leukocytes? No, that doesn't make sense. Eosinophilia, yes. 
Okay, that's the right answer. C is anemia. That's just simply uh, low, you know, you've got low uh, hemoglobin in that case. So that doesn't have anything to do with the, the leukocytes. And polycythemia means that you have a lot of cells. And usually the cells that you have the most of are the red blood cells. So again, it doesn't apply there. But just remember that allergies, if your patient is allergic, and that seems to be a very popular thing, uh, popular um, pathology in the United States is allergy, right? So your patient, if they're truly allergic, they should have an increase in IgE and an increase in eosinophils. Now, this is, I thought this was a little confusing. What happens is, is that IgE is increased and that's a, you know, the mast cells recruit uh, or rather release your anaphylotoxin C, uh, C5A and, and we know that that causes histamine release and all that. But it recruits eosinophils and even though eosinophils kind of are, have an antihistamine, they have a histaminase and they sort of clean up this mess, they are definitely instrumental in causing you know, some of the symptoms of, of your allergies. So if you see a test question um, and you have a patient that is very allergic and they're having reactions and you have the opportunity to suppress the eosinophils in the answer choices, take it. So in other words, what increases the eosinophils would be um, IL-5. So if you can have an anti-IL-5, take it. Um, you know, if what causes IgE, um, isotype switching, your IL-4. If you can do an anti-IL-4, take it. All right, and, um, and if we remember how this is mediated, just quickly, you've got your friendly mast cell, and you have this pre, uh, you have this pre exposure. So you have your IgE sticking up here, your N IgE antibodies, because remember the mast cell has an FC uh, epsilon R receptor. All right. And then along comes the peanut or whatever you're allergic to that you got exposed to, maybe even in the womb. Maybe you've never eaten a peanut or something, but you got exposed to it at some point, all right? And he comes and he binds these two guys, and then off we go, and you get the release of your, uh, your mediators, okay? So that's how that works. All right, number 12. Your patient is prone to skin infections and abscesses. You suspect a defect in the innate immune system. You might test for the activity of one of the enzymes of the innate system with the NBT. It's called nitro blue uh, tetrazoline test, which, you know, I'm told they don't really do anymore except for on the USMLE and other board exams. Um, but your test, you test your patient and a purple color does not emerge. So in other words, um, it's just yellow. So what is the deficient enzyme that we're talking about here? And the answer is B, NADPH oxidase. Okay, so what that purple color does is essentially, if you're able to uh, create these reactive species, remember you, you, you can create uh, hydrogen peroxide, then that's going to bubble up and that's going to cause a color change and you're going to get this purple. And that's a good thing. That's a positive test. It's confusing. A positive test is a good thing with regard to the MBT test, okay? But if you get a negative test and it's clear or yellowish, then you know that your patient does not have that particular enzyme. That's how that works. So um, let's say that you had a, let's just unpack the other answers. So A, C1 esterase. If you had a deficiency in C1 esterase, you wouldn't be able to active, you wouldn't be able to split C1, so you wouldn't be able to do the classical complement pathway. Um, so you wouldn't be able to opsonize so great in the classical pathway, all right? In which case you would be susceptible to certain pathogens like uh, the slimy guys. So for example, um, you would be susceptible to uh, strep pneumoniae, you'd be susceptible to H influenza B and, and Neisseria uh, meningitis as well. Uh, C is myeloperoxidase. That would be a case where uh, you couldn't create the bleach to kill the bugs. And then superoxide dismutase, that's part of that pathway that creates reactive oxygen species. So the answer is B. Number 13, okay, getting toward the end. Say it again. Um, you suspect your patient has uh, a pathology associated with autoimmunity. It's most likely that he would have a deficiency in cells that have the following, okay? So in other words, he has an immune system that's attacking himself, right? So it's autoimmunity. So 
what, which one of these cells essentially regulates the immune system? That's all you have to ask yourself. And the only one that regulates the immune system and turns it down, if you will, is E, FOXP3. So that's the answer. Number 14 is there are two uh, T cell types that perform immune regulation. One type originates in the thymus and proliferates uh, under the uh, one type originates in the in the thymus and then the other is out there in the system okay out there in the body and in that case it is going to proliferate under the influence of which cytokine so I'm talking about the two regs right you have the N the uh, the T regs from the thymus and then I'm talking about the AI regs that are just out there that are differentiated from your T naught cells okay and this needs TGF uh, TGF beta in order to proliferate all right. Uh, number 15, so the answer, sorry, is C. Number 15 is another cause of autoimmunity would be due to the overexpression of which of the following. So in this case, we're talking about the patient, again, has too much of an immune response. So the only one that gives you too much of an immune response is going to be A, which is IL-21. And that's kind of an oddball that we didn't talk a lot about, but remember that helps you to uh, push a TH17 response, which is, which is known to be instrumental in inflammatory disease. All right, so the answer there is uh, 21. Remember, IL-4 is going to push you towards a TH2 response. It's going to isotype switch to IgE. IL-10 is going to be the party pooper. Again, it's going to stop the NK cells from interferon gamma. And TGF-beta is, uh, is one of the cytokines that's going to push you to an AI, to a regulatory. So it's definitely not the right answer. So that completes that first section of immunoapplication. Thank you very much.